Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess a new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. And Adam knew his wife, Eve, who was pregnant by Samael, the angel of death, and she conceived and bare Cain. And he was like the heavenly beings and not like the earthly beings. And she said, I have gotten a man from the angel of the Lord. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on freedomslips.com. And I thank those of you that have taken the time to join us this evening as we broadcast live here every Wednesday, 8 to 10 p.m. on Studio B for joining us for live discussion. And know that we really appreciate your fellowship and thank you in advance uh, for always taking the time to to come to listen to us and to hear what we have to say. It's a beautiful thing to be able to share um, introspection, research, study with those of you that are also seeking to advance yourself in knowledge and knowing and to come to revelation on so many things that, you know, that so much of the world is little concerned with and just not willing to put forth the effort and the time to to study and to come to revelation upon. And to me, that's such a sad thing because um, there's so much in world so much going on in world, especially with our being, in my opinion, the last, the fig tree generation. And those of you that listened to the last show, I covered that in great detail and spoke about how in the scriptures, in prophecy, it shows and verifies that it would be during our generation that all things would be prophetically fulfilled. And so there is also prophesied within the word that the spirit of God and the spirit of truth and knowledge would be revealed in such way that it would be poured out on all flesh in this day and age and in this time, and that everything would be brought to light, that there would be nothing new under the sun and all the secrets of old, all the lost ancient traditions, all the mythologies of old, that all that would be brought to light in new understanding, in new revelation. And people, those that are willing to to seek and to know and that are wanting to know that the answers could be found and to me that is a a deeply profound promise and one that has me personally invested into seeking out truth and i know that all of you are similar in that regard and that you are wanting to know and what's going on with the world and that we're not just appeased by the distractions and the entertainment and the um the what seems to be just noise you know chatter 
uh, of mainstream news and propaganda and the various shows and movies and everything else that is put out in order to keep us swayed, keep us distracted from coming to understanding and discernment on the larger aspects for our reasons for being here in this world and coming to terms with what's really up, you know, and who we are and why we're here and what all of this is truly all about. And so uh, it seems like there's, you know, just this small group, um, which there's a motto for our website uh, at Fallen Angels TV, the seeker of lost paradise may seem a fool to those whom have never sought the other worlds and how so very true they consider us and count us off write us all off as lunatic uh, fringe and conspiracy theorists and tinfoil hat you know wearing uh whatever and and they have all these negative connotations and derogatory terms for individuals like myself and yourself that are invested in knowing the truth of what's going on in the world. And because the truth is so just incredibly strange and so just awkward when it comes to what we have been told uh, is reality, um, that the, the background story, the the Oz behind the mask, all of that is just so weird. And, and and even the way that it ties together with the the biblical narrative, the uh the whole story of the serpent in the garden, which beguiled Eve and tempted her to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, all that just seems symbolically and metaphorically bland and meaningless to most. You know, they teach that Eve ate an apple in Sunday school. And when you go to the mainstream pastors and and ask them about that, they'll just tell you, you know, oh, well, that's just, a, that's just an old story. There's nothing real or meaningful behind it. And yet when you come to understanding on what is really going on in the world and how there is this dragon reptilian uh, fallen angelic presence here in the world that has even predated that of the fall of modern humanity and that has been here and involved interacting with the pre-Adamic humans, which, um, you know, again, predate that of the last 6,000 years of modern humanity. All of that just seems completely, um, completely lunatic fringe. And yet, when you look into the oral traditions, do research and study on the historical aspects of serpent worship worldwide in the pre-Adamic, the antediluvian world. It is the serpent and trees and phallic symbols and um, sex, sexual icons which have been revered for untold millennia going back to the dawn of humanity and even further that we have throughout history the worship of the feathered serpent worldwide. And again, when you have understanding and you have discernment and you study and read the narrative in Genesis of the serpent beguiling Eve, tempting her to eat from this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, 
it does not seemingly make sense until you have deeper and more profound revelation on that particular story. And so we're going to speak about that this evening because there's some new knowledge which I have recently discovered, which I'm writing about. Uh, this is part, what I'm going to be speaking about this evening is part of what is the second book of this trilogy that I'm working on right now. It's called The Great Contest. And it begins with The War in Heaven. That's the first book of the trilogy. The Great Contest, The War in Heaven. And I'm almost done with that right now. I'm doing a final read through and I am on like chapter 13 of the 18 chapters of this book. And so I believe I will be able to get it out and release it to the public in about a month's time. Um, I just want to finalize a few things and then I'm going to release it. But the second book is also already mostly written and it's just a matter of going through and finalizing in, you know, last proofread the content and the material and making sure it says what I wanted to say in, a, in the manner that I wanted to say. And so really I'm thinking that even for the second book, which is going to be called The Great Contest, The Enmity Between the Seed Lines, um, that it's in that book that I deeply explain and expound upon what I'm a, what I'm speaking about here. But in the trilogy, I begin with the war in heaven because that's where the angelic rebellion begins. That's where Lucifer, uh, the the ancient dragon, <clears throat> that old serpent which deceiveth the whole world. That's where <clears throat> he rebels against the the sun and the dominion the establishment the appointment of yeshua as the leader of the angelic hierarchy and being jealous of such appointment he he is um angry and envious and because of that it, iniquity is found within him and then so he is has this thought of exalting his throne above the stars and the clouds of God and establishing himself as being like the most high and so he conspires quietly thinking that you know, he's doing this all behind the scenes, but the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, they know from the moment this thought comes into his mind that he's plotting, but they allow him to do so anyways because they want to see how far he's going to push it. Hello, Don and Link and Zippy and Zoner. Um... Piney, Lauren, Kitty, Thunder, Kathy, Red, uh, Water, all the rest of you that are in the chat room, not in the immediate scroll, know that I appreciate all of you and that I send my love and I send my regards and I pray that the Most High watch over and keep all of you safe going into this new year. And I pray also that more of our loved ones, our family and our friends and those that are closest to us that they seek truth and come to deeper, more profound and intimate relationship with the Godhead and with the Savior Messiah. And I pray that for all of us 
And I pray that we each also um, establish ourselves in remembrance and that we empower each other and encourage one another to fulfilling our sacred vow and to fulfilling our deeper reasons for why we are here and what we are to do. Because it's in my opinion that especially those of us that are seeking deeply, that we are part of and numbered with those that are of the sheep that truly hear his voice and that are really in service to humanity and each other. And that because we dedicate ourselves to kingdom that we are being utilized as keepers of the secret as holders of the wisdom and that the most high will send many others to each of us in allowing us to guide and direct and give them answer to those questions which are they are perplexed and riddled by and that they are really wanting to know more and wanting to understand the gospel in the way that many of us have been led to revelation upon. And for that reason, so many will truly reach out to us in seeking our opinion. And so I do believe that all of us have special role, mission, and election for this time, this day, and this age. And that because of that special assignment that we really we have to stand each other up and support each other and encourage each other empower one another to to fulfill what we are here to really do and so um, that's why we are coming together in fellowship in the way that we are because again we're seeking answers seeking truth with one another so that we can help others. And and that's what it's all about, because again, the hour is late. And so, um, what I wanted to cover this evening and what I wanted to speak on is, um, you know, I had told you about the, the great contest, this trilogy. But specifically, I had recently found three new pieces of knowledge which I will be focusing on and I will be also bringing forth other verses because again in publishing Lucifer Father of Cain in 2010 in April of 2010 I have since that time discovered so much new and critical information which has been and is tied to so many aspects of the work that was published within that book. And I did cover so much. It wasn't just about the serpent seed. It wasn't just about um, decrypting and deciphering what had happened in the garden. With, and, or the parable of the wheat and the tares or what the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil really was. There's so much more contained within that book. The, uh, the war in heaven, the war against the giants in Canaan land, uh, not to mention everything as far as Genesis 3, Genesis 4. Genesis 5 and that whole aspect of, again, the 
serpent beguiling Eve, the feathered serpent, this dragon-like entity, this enchanter, shining one. And so that's why I decided to split up. And that book, when I published it, was like 300 and something pages. And now with all the new information I've added to it, the first book on the war in heaven is in and of itself 300 plus pages. And the second book on the enmity between the seed lines, it in and of itself is 400 plus pages. And then the third book of the trilogy, uh, The War Against the Giants in Canaan Land, that in and of itself is another 300 pages. And so that one 300 page book ended up being now a thousand pages of information. That's how much new material I've discovered and added to the premises of what was all contained in that one book. And so to this evening, I'm going to open with three pieces. Um, specifically, this has to do with the verse in 2 Corinthians, which I, I had cited in the show description, it says, and again, I always try to start with the canon because I want to always uh, prove this knowledge and tie it to what is cited in the canonical material because so many say that you know, it's only in the extra biblical text which this information, this knowledge is is found and to be discovered, but that's absolutely false. Even though, yes, you can find it alluded to and confirmed in great manner within the extra biblical text it's unnecessary to go outside of the canon to, to lay this out as foundational truth, which I've done in many different shows where even just covering Matthew chapter 13, um, just that one chapter, it's so deeply profound. I could fill up easily three two-hour shows just talking about what Christ himself said in reference to this as knowledge. And so, you know, um, and that's not including all of what is found in Genesis 3, 4, and 5, and places like 1 John chapter 3, Cain, who was of that wicked one, and what I'm about to quote from here in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2 and 3, where it says, For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so what is Paul talking about here? Why, why is he mentioning presenting us as the bride to the bridegroom, the, which we know that Yeshua is the bridegroom, and that, as it says in Matthew 25 on the parable of the ten virgins, the wise virgins that were ready and awaiting the bridegroom, and those that were not, and that they missed the wedding feast. Here, Paul is alluding to that 
the same thing to the wedding feast. And he's speaking about presenting us as a chaste virgin to Christ. But then he says, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so he's saying and alluding to in this verse that the serpent beguiling Eve through his subtlety, that's what caused her to not be a chaste virgin. And so the serpent beguiling Eve, tempting her to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Paul is equating that temptation and that beguilement when you look up the word beguile in, uh, in here in the Greek New Testament, uh, it means wholly seduced. Wholly seduced. Just like it does in Genesis chapter 3, in the Hebrew, the, the word beguiled there in the Hebrew is also means wholly seduced. And so Paul is referencing her Eve's temptation and her eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that that is what caused her to lose her virginity and to no longer be a chaste virgin. Now, how does a woman lose her virginity? Well, obviously through sexual corruption. And so, how, oh goodness, this segment went by fast. All right, we'll be right back, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, that segment went really fast, but anyway, so what I was saying about what Paul was referencing in 2 Corinthians, and again, we're starting with the canon so we can establish this as foundation um, and revelation, which is most certainly encoded into the context of the canon. It's just that most people, because they're not taught this in their Sunday schools and their pastors, preachers, ministers, priests, in no way reference this as knowledge to them. Uh, or if they do mention it, it's in condemnation that they don't understand this, the truth of what is really being spoken about in the early chapters in Genesis. And so we're going to, um, you know, I'm going to share some of the new things that I've discovered in, in specific to this particular passage because there's a, two other sources that I'd like to share which are connected specifically to this verse and the revelation contained therein. And so again, the whole idea of Eve losing her virginity, how in any way does that in any kind of manner make any sense if you apply the whole garden parable and her having eaten fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, how did that cause her to lose her virginity? And why is it that in the scriptures it says that the serpent beguiled, wholly seduced Eve? if she ate a, an apple, how, how does her eating a piece of fruit, what does that have to do with the serpent wholly seducing her? And how is it that 
the serpent seducing her resulted in her, again, being sexually corrupted if, in fact, the fruit is an apple or a pomegranate or a fig or whatever else they try to say that it was as far as, you know, being a literal fruit from a, a, a tree. It just does not make any kind of sense. And so the next thing I want to share has to do with a quote from one of the church fathers, Tertullian. And for those that don't know, he's one of those that, you know, came up and that wrote about uh, in great manner a lot of the books and the interpretations thereof uh, speaking about certain aspects of scripture in the early formation of the church and he was instrumental in establishing the foundational beliefs of what became the early Christian church and I'm going to read a passage about this to, to help you to understand uh, what and how this is, what this is alluding to as far as Paul, because this will be the second confirming witness to uh, what Paul is alluding to in 2 Corinthians. It says this, for straightway that impatience conceived of the devil's seed produced the fecundity of malice, anger as her son, and when brought forth, trained him in her own arts. For that very thing which had immersed Adam and Eve in death taught their son too to begin with murder. It would be idle for me to ascribe this to impatience if Cain, that first homicide and first fratricide, had borne with equanimity and not impatiently the refusal by the Lord of his own oblations if he is not wroth with his own brother, if finally he took away no one's life. Since then, he could neither have killed unless he had been wroth, nor have been wroth unless he had been impatient. He demonstrates that what he did through wrath must be referred to that by which wrath was suggested during this cradle time of impatience. Then, in a certain sense, in her infancy. But how great presently were her augmentation. This is the important part. And no wonder, if she has been the first delinquent, it is a consequence that because she has been the first, therefore, she is the only parent stem to, to every delinquency pouring down from her own fount various veins of crimes, of murder we have spoken, but being from the very beginning the outcome of anger, whatever cause besides it shortly found for itself, it lays collectively on the account of impatience as it as to its own origin for whether from private enmities or from the sake of prey anyone perpetuates that wickedness the earlier step is his becoming impatient of either the hatred or the avarice whatever compels a man it is not possible that without impatience 
of itself it can be perfected indeed. Whoever committeth adultery without impatience of lust. And so he's talking about here about how Cain's wickedness stems from the fact that Eve was the first delinquent. And being delinquent, meaning, you know, that she was, uh, that she had partaken of criminality and that she was led into committing sin, that he's speaking about just as Paul had done about her not being moral. And because she was delinquent and allowed herself to be beguiled and lust, lusting after the serpent, that that is where the origins for Cain's wickedness is derived from. And not only Cain's, but Tertullian says that therefore she is the only parent stem to, to every delinquency pouring down from her own fount various veins of crimes. Of murder we have spoken, but being from the very beginning the outcome of anger. And so he's saying that just as Cain is considered to be the first murderer, liar, and deceiver, that so did all of this find root within her. Which again, this is also connected to where it says in Genesis that um, Eve is the mother of all living because she was in fact the mother of both the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The root of the seed of the serpent being found within her since she is the mother of Cain, who is the firstborn hybrid son of the devil and the patriarch and the progeny of the tares, the goats, and the children of perdition, and she's also the mother of Abel and Seth. Abel being killed by his half-brother Cain, it is through Seth that the seed of the woman are propagated. And that is Adam's line, which is also why in Genesis you have this distinction and the separation of the generations and the lineage, the blood lineage of Cain being cited in Genesis chapter 4 and the generations of Adam being cited in Genesis chapter 5, which I will elaborate on further here in short bit. But, um, but I'm going to continue because Tertullian also speaks a little bit more about this in a different passage. Um, that was on patience, Tertullian, um, on patience, chapter 5. You can go and read it for yourself in, in its full context because it's a lot longer than what I cited here. I'm just narrowing in uh, on the specifics of what, excuse me, is tied to the same thing that Paul is referencing in 2 Corinthians. This next passage from Tertullian says this, He began to sin when he sowed the seed of sin, and so from then onwards, was engaged in the multitude of his merchandise, his wickedness, the full measure of his transgressions. For he also being a spirit was no less than the man created with freedom of choice. And so this is referencing how Lucifer, Satan, the adversary, 
is just as it says in first uh first John chapter three, Cain, who was of that wicked one, that he is the one that sowed the seed of sin. All right. I'm gonna um bring up two other things because I want to give you four confirming witnesses as to what I am referencing here as Paul brought it out. The other one is from Maccabees 4. Uh, Maccabees 4. And this used to be part of, and if you have any questions, put it in the chat room. I will be glad to answer and elaborate further, but um, know that I'm not looking at the chat room because I'm specifically reading from these verses, but uh, Kathy will relay it to me if you have something you'd like to share in question or compliment, uh, commentary. So, But anyways, all right. From Maccabees chapter 4, verse 6 through 8, it says this. The mother of seven sons expressed also these principles to her children. I was a pure virgin and did not go outside my father's house, but I guarded the rib from, from which woman was made. No seducer corrupted me on a desert plain, nor did the destroyer, the deceitful serpent, defile the purity of my virginity. In the time of my maturity, I remained with my husband, and when these sons had grown up, their father died. And so, just to give you the background story of what. Um, what this mother is speaking about. This is actually the wife of Eleazar, the high priest, during what was the Maccabean Wars. And he was, they had tried to force him and his seven sons and his wife to eat food sacrificed unto idols. And they refused to do so. And she encouraged her seven sons after they had watched their father be tortured to death. She had encouraged them to also remain pure as far as their, um, as far as their faith and stay steady in upholding to upholding to and, and remaining truthful to uh, what they were you know what they were going through and that to even give up their lives unto the death in remaining uh, you know firm in their beliefs Okay, um, and so that and so in that story in four Maccabees, when you read the fullness of the text, you will see that it is, you know, again, they are being punished and forced to break their their vows and to, you know, again, eat food sacrificed unto idols, and she refused to, to do so, and so she's telling the story of how she remained chaste and was pure. And she is alluding to what happened in Genesis chapter 3 with Eve being beguiled by the serpent, which is why she says in this story and relating it and speaking uh, about her being the mother of seven sons, she says... I was a pure virgin and did not go outside my father's house. Meaning that, 
you know, just as um, in Adam, that, you know, if she would have just only mated with and slept with Adam, that she would have been fine. But she actually took and w to, as lover, the serpent, the Nakash. And that's what her eating fruit from the tree of the knowledge, good and evil, that's what the metaphoric and symbolic um, meaning of that whole story, the garden parable, is actually alluding to. That she took a lover outside of her father's, um, well, outside of Adam. And um, that's also why it says when she is chastised in Genesis chapter 3, that her desire would be to her husband. And I'll go into that more he here when we return from this break. But I just wanted to, you know, again, cover this in, in detail. And there's another thing I want to bring up, too, when we come back from break. Um, but, again, verse 8, she says, No seducer corrupted me on a desert plain. Nor did the destroyer, the deceitful serpent, defile the purity of my virginity. And so this illusion has everything to do with the fact that it was common knowledge to the Hebrew peoples, to the Israelites, and to those that were familiar with the Torah. It was common knowledge that this is what had happened to Eve and that she had been, in fact, wholly seduced by the serpent. Now, I'm going to give you, hopefully I'll be able to share this one other story with you before we go to break. This one is from the Protoevangelion of James. It says this, and I'll, I'll, I'll just read it, and hopefully I'll be able to explain it when we come back from break. Um, but James is the half-brother of Yeshua, and he was, you know, um, one of the sons of Joseph before he took Mary as uh, to be the caretaker of Mary, who, again, was the virgin mother of Christ. Uh, but here, and I'm going to read this story. It says this. Now it was the sixth month with her, and behold, Joseph came from his building, and he entered into his house and found her great with child. And he smote his face and cast himself down upon the ground on sackcloth and wept bitterly, saying, With what countenance shall I look unto the Lord my God, and what prayer shall I make concerning this maiden? I'll finish it when we come back. Be right back, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, I do want to, before, well, I guess I should finish up this story first, and then I will um, address the question about Lilith. And, and I will. I'll elaborate on that after, but I want to finish up this story that I was citing uh, from the Proud Evangelion of James. Because this links to, as I said, um, the same thing with Eve being beguiled and how her beguilement caused her to lose her virginity. And so, uh, and I'll give you a little background of the story. The Protoevangelion of James is about the infancy gospels. It shares in detail, the stories of Mary, um, how she was, you know, who, how she came to be born uh, of her parents, Joachim and Anna, which, like Sarah, uh, Abraham, Sarah, she was uh, very old and had no children, and because of that, there. Both of them were criticized, and and it wasn't until she was very old that then she 
gave birth to Mary and they had promised that if they if God would deliver to them a child that they would dedicate her to the faith and uh, give her over to the temple to be a virgin in the temple and um, and they would dedicate her whole life to you know serving as a temple maiden and so from the time that she was three years old to the time that she was 14 she was um, she was a maiden in the holy temple and she served there and when the temple maidens reached the age of 14 years old they were expected to take on husbands and to then begin their own families but mary did not want to get married to anybody and she did not want to um take on a husband and did not want to have children she wanted to remain a virgin for the entirety of her life and so the high priest did not know really what to do with her and so they then he went into prayer and he asked god you know as to what to do with her and he was shown uh to bring all the elders of the of the different tribes the israelites of the israelites the 12 tribes of the israelites and that he would there would be a miraculous sign and that person that was appointed in with this sign would become her caretaker and um, that's when joseph was chosen and joseph was already an elderly widowed man he his wife had passed away and he had children that were very much older um then even mary who was you know um at the time that they were trying to decide this she was 15 years old and when he finally was betrothed uh, she was betrothed to him and he took her on as not a wife but he became her caretaker she was then 16 years old and this is the story where i'm at now because he left for six months to go and build. He was uh, involved in construction. He was a carpenter, and he built like king's thrones and did woodwork and things of that nature, very ornate woodwork. And so he was considered to be a carpenter. Um, but he was involved in the construction of buildings and things of that nature. And so he had left for six months. He comes back and he discovers her pregnant. And so this is what he says. With what countenance shall I look unto the Lord my God, and what prayer shall I make concerning this maiden? For I received her out of the temple of the Lord my God, a virgin, and have not kept her safe. Who is he that hath ensnared me? Who hath done this evil in mine house, and hath defiled the virgin? Is not the story of Adam repeated in me? For as at the hour of his giving thanks, the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her, so hath it befallen me also. And Joseph arose from off the sackcloth and called Mary and said unto her, O thou that was cared for by God, why hast thou done this? Thou hast forgotten the Lord thy God. Why hast thou humbled thy soul, thou that wast nourished up in the holy of holies, and didst receive food at the hand of an angel? But she wept bitterly, saying, I am pure, and I know not a man. And Joseph said unto her, Whence then is that which is in thy womb? And she said, As the, as the Lord my God liveth, I know not whence it is come unto me. And so you can see that uh, Joseph says he was not able to protect Mary and who hath ensnared him. 
who hath done this evil in mine house and hath defiled the virgin? So he's like, who corrupted her? Who snuck into my house and did this to her? And and so then he says, is not the story of Adam repeated in me? For as at the hour of his giving thanks, the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her, so hath it befallen me also. So he's saying that the same thing that happened to Adam in that, you know, before he had even, not that Joseph was ever going to sleep with Mary, he was only her caretaker, but while she was under his protection and in his custody as a guardian, just like Adam, uh, he came home and found her pregnant. And he's saying here that the same thing that happened to Adam has now happened to him. But he is again relating what happened to Adam as the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her. So hath it befallen me also. And so he is relating just as Paul did and just as Tertullian and just as the mother in the story of Maccabees, they're all alluding to the fact that it was common knowledge that Eve had been beguiled by the serpent. And that, that is the reason why she ended up being pregnant with Cain, who was the firstborn son of the devil. And so there's four witnesses all confirming this as story. And I'm going to give you one more, and then I'm going to you know, speak on Lilith. All right. The next story that I want to bring up is from the Gospel of Philip, which is part of the Nag Hammadi Codices, which were recently discovered. Well, 1945, they were discovered right before Israel became a nation again. But there's a portion of the text in there that says, He who has been created is beautiful, but you would not find his son's noble creations. If he were not created, but begotten, you would find that his seed was noble. But now he was created and he begot. What nobility is this? First, adultery came into being. Afterward, murder. And he was begotten in adultery, for he was the child of the serpent. So he became a murderer, just like his father, and he killed his brother. Indeed, every act of sexual intercourse which has occurred between those unlike one another is adultery. All right, so I bet you're scratching your head and you're like, what the heck is he talking about? So I'm going to explain this. I'm going to decrypt this passage for you. Because once you understand what this passage is referencing, it is absolutely undeniable that it was in most certainly Lucifer, Satan the adversary, an angelic being which beguiled Eve and impregnated her with Cain. And that Cain, Cain was most certainly the firstborn son of the devil. All right, so let's break this down. He who has been created is beautiful, but you would not find his son's noble creation. What is that speaking about? There's the difference between the angels and humanity is that angels being directly created beings are not begotten, meaning that they are not born of woman, and that humanity, besides Adam and Eve, because they were, yes, they were created beings, but as far as 
ye children of humanity, every child born to humankind from the very first Cain and the second Abel. They have come from the womb of a woman. They were begotten, born of woman. And so these two first two verses are alluding to the fact that he who has been created is beautiful. That is an allusion to Lucifer, who we know, according to Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, was the most beautiful angel. And he was so beautiful that he became enamored of himself. He was so vain that he became jealous and ended up falling. Um, and so that's what it, that's who it's alluding to in the very first verse. He who has been created is beautiful, speaking about Lucifer, but you would not find his son's noble creations. That's a reference to Cain. Why was Cain not a noble creation? And next verse, and then I'll explain it. If he were not created, but begotten, meaning that if he were not an angelic being, but born of woman and begotten of woman, a, a regular human being, you would find that his seed was noble, meaning that if, if he was a regular human being and he had begotten children, just like all other human beings, they would have been regular, normal, non-hybrid entities, meaning that they would have been regular, nor no, what is referenced here as noble creations. But because he was an angel and he did engage in intimacy and impregnated Eve, that that's why his children are not referenced as noble, meaning Cain was not supposed to be begotten. He was not supposed to engage in sex with Eve, which is why when he did so, they were all cast out of the heavens and he was punished um, you know, his arms and limbs and legs removed and he was put on his belly. Um, that's what it's all referencing. So, next verse. But now he was created, meaning he was an angel, and he begot, meaning he had children. What nobility is this? Meaning that, you know, how was this natural? It wasn't. And then this is the consequences of him being an angelic being and then having children with Eve as a human host, as a human woman. It says this, first adultery came into being. That's the seduction of Eve. He beguiled her, seduced her. That's what caused her not to not be a chaste virgin. First adultery came into being afterward murder so what how did that happen adultery eve being beguiled led to her being pregnant with cain giving birth to him that's when murder took place which is the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent the prophecy contained in genesis 3 verse 15 that was fulfilled in Genesis 4, when Cain murdered Abel, his half-brother. And so, again, first adultery came into being, afterward murder. And he, meaning Cain, was begotten in adultery. Now, if he were the child of Adam, it would not say that he was begotten in adultery because Adam was Eve's husband and that wasn't it wouldn't have been adulterous for her to 
um, to have sex with him and to have children by him. But it says here that he was begotten in adultery, meaning that Cain was born as a result of an adulterous affair. For And then the next verse makes it clear, for he was the child of the serpent. And so, yes, it was because Lucifer as a created angelic being, because he was not begotten of woman, and because he engaged in uh, having sex with Eve and uh, seduced her, that Cain was born, and he was the child of the serpent. Next verse. And so he became a murderer just like his father. Why is his father, Satan, cited as being a murderer? Because his tempting Adam and Eve to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is what caused them to lose their immortal bright nature and to be transformed into flesh. And when they were transformed into flesh, that's when, that's when um, death came into being. And so Satan is considered to be the murderer of humanity. And that's why it says here, so he became a murderer just like his father, and he killed his brother. So, I mean, if that's not, if that's not clear to you, I mean, you're really, you, you just have to be in denial and no matter what anybody says and no matter what how many points of reference are brought up you're just never going to accept this as truth and so um it seems obvious absolutely clear that this is what happened in genesis chapter 3 and so when you read the story in Genesis, it makes sense that the serpent beguiling Eve and getting her to eat fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that this is what had happened, that she was seduced, she was beguiled, and she was impregnated with Cain, which is why... Um, in that passage that I read at the very beginning of the show, it says that that Cain was like the heavenly beings and not like the earthly beings. All right, we're running out of time, so let me go ahead and address Lilith. As far as um, Suri had put in the chat room that he believed that Lilith is the was the first wife of Cain. I mean, the first wife of Adam. Now, I, I've looked at and examined this from many, many, because I've read, you know, most all of the extra biblical texts. And I say most because I'm sure there are some out there which I may never have heard of and not had a chance to read. But as far as what I could get my hands on, I have read everything I could. But... With regards to Lilith, and the reason I don't buy into it and don't accept it as being factual is because the Bible says, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses shall the truth be established. And there are not three, two or three witnesses. There's one source for the story, and that is the supposed alphabet of Ben Sirach, which speaks about how Lilith refused to um, be Adam's wife because she refused to take on missionary position in, in, in sex, in lovemaking. She refused to take on a mission, missionary position which, as I said, with regard to Adam and Eve, it wasn't until after they ate fruit 
from the tree of the knowledge good and evil that they were transformed into flesh and that you know sex was even possible in fact it says in the in the quran that their genitals didn't even show up until they touched the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and that when they did so their genitals appeared they were transformed into flesh and that's what made possible them having uh, sex. And initially, Eve was beguiled by the serpent, and that's why and how she became impregnated with Cain. And then Adam eating the fruit is him repeating the act he had witnessed uh, with Eve, and that's what resulted in her being pregnant with Abel. And thus, um, she then gave birth to fraternal twins, Cain being the elder and Abel being the second. And so, in, in my opinion, uh, Lilith, Adam, was not even capable of having sex until he ate fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so it doesn't make sense to me that Lilith would refuse to um, be his wife because she did not want to assume the submissive role in the act of lovemaking. Because it doesn't make sense to me that they would even be engaging in lovemaking when there was no need for it, which is why it says in Matthew that uh, the angels, you know, are not given in marriage because being angels, they didn't need to procreate. They didn't need to engage in uh, physical lovemaking. And so that's why I don't accept the whole premise that Lilith was the first wife of Adam. And where it says in, because everybody believes that where it says in Genesis 1, verse 26 to 28, that he had made them, uh, th let us create man, make man in our image, that is actually referencing pre-Adamic humanity, which I cover in great detail in other shows. All right, we'll be right back, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody, for final segment. I do want to remind everybody that Revolution Radio is a listener-supported, commercial-free and corporate-free radio network, and that in order for us to continue coming to you in the way that we do and speaking about the many aspects of truth that we do, uh, that we could use your financial support and that um, those of you that can, even for just the price of um, going to uh, Burger King or McDonald's, the price of a Happy Meal for four ninety five a month, you can support us and gain access to all of the archives from all the various hosts that come to you on both Studios A and Studio B seven days a week, almost 24 hours a day. And so those of you that can, again, definitely feed and support your families and take care of yourself first. But again, if you can, it would be greatly appreciative. Go to freedomslips.com, click on the donate button and just subscribe to the archives and know that we appreciate you. And it helps us to keep coming to you in the way that we do. Um, all right, and so I was just saying as far as the as far as Lilith, that she is, uh, there was a question from uh, Batsman, uh, who is Lilith and where is she mentioned in the text? She's mentioned in Isaiah in the, in the Bible one time, but as a, um, like a demon, like a, uh, a succubus, incubus type of entity. And in according to Jewish mythology, she 
wages war against the children and is responsible for killing young children and things like uh, sudden infant death syndrome in the early days uh, is are ascribed to Lilith coming and, and killing the babies and that supposedly she made a pact to when she left Adam that she would wage war against the children of Adam and Eve and and as a demon, uh, demoniac, a demoness, uh, she is said to to do so. And so, but again, um, in my opinion, the verse Genesis 1, verse 26 through 28, where it speaks about, let us create man in our image, and this was done by Elohim, God, um, that this is a different creation uh, from that as spoken of in Genesis chapter 2, where it speaks about creating and that it is Yahweh Elohim that creates, well, actually forms Adam. Uh, and so even the verbs for the creation and the formation of Adam are different. And so in my opinion, again, these are two different creations and that the first creation being cited as being completed and done by Elohim, that this was the pre-Adamic races. And it also says that they were made male and female, which uh, a lot of people speculate and believe that to be a reference to Lilith and Adam. And that, you know, again, Lilith was Adam's first wife, but um, in my opinion, these verses are actually referencing the pre-Adamic races, the antediluvian races, being created as couples, and that there were multiple races, uh, Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, we have these pre-Adamic hominids um, being discovered and created in, as couples and spread and told to multiply throughout the creation. And so that's what it's actually referencing in those particular verses. All right. Let me continue because I want to finish this up. And so I gave you five verses which are speaking about the beguilement of Eve and how this, again, was common knowledge. And it's even cited by Tertullian, and he talks about how it, in the early days they knew this to be true, and they accepted this as truth. And like the, you know, we just did a show uh, on New Year's Eve. I did a three-hour show with now you see TV, David Carrico, John Hall, and John Pounders over there, and now you see TV, speaking about how the lunar Sabbath and the ancient Hebrew calendar, how all of that was common knowledge, and that it's only by understanding how that calendar system works that one can then determine the, uh, the Sabbaths and also the correct days to celebrate the feasts and the festivals as cited in Leviticus chapter 23. And so um, this is another one of those things that was absolutely common knowledge and why in, in Matthew chapter 13, Christ references and speaks about this, and I'll read that really quick. You can read the whole parable, and as I said earlier in the show, I could spend four hours just speaking about the references that Christ made to the distinction between the wheat and the tares, the tares being the children of the wicked one, the children of the devil, the enemy which snuck into the garden. And he clarifies this in, in great detail in verse 36 through 43, Genesis 
I mean, Matthew chapter 13, 36 through 43, he is speaking about the same thing that Paul references, that Joseph references, uh, that the, the, the mother of the seven sons in Maccabees is referencing, that Tertullian is referencing. They are all speaking about the exact same thing. But Jesus clarifies, Yeshua clarifies it in great detail in Matthew 13 when he says, and when he is asked by the apostles, his disciples, to explain to him, to them, what the parable of the tares of the field is. What the heck are you speaking about when you speak about the, the wheat and the tares? And he says, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The wicked one. John, 1 John chapter 3, where it says Cain, who was of that wicked one. This is what Christ is referencing here. The tares are the children of the wicked one, alluding to Cain. Just as I read in that passage from Gospel of Philip, Cain, he was of the serpent. Uh, you know, first adultery came into being and then murder. Same thing. And I will put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Between thy sons and her sons. All right, so continuing. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The enemy, that's a reference to the parable of the kingdom, which um, I believe it's in like verse 15 or something of that nature. But he's referencing that. And then he's telling you that the enemy is the devil. Revelation 12, the devil, that old, that ancient dragon, that old serpent that deceiveth the whole world, the same being, that same entity, Satan the adversary, he is the one that sowed the tares. Meaning, yes, he is the father of Cain, the wicked one, Cain, who was of the wicked one. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of of this world. So he's tying together the harvest, the separation of the wheat and the tares, with the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And he says that because not everybody accepts this as truth. Most try to fight against it and deny it. And because of that, they are not counted as having ears to hear or the eyes to see or a mind to understand. All right. I'm going to read uh, just a couple more verses from different things to give you more confirmation of this. The book of Jasher, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And it was in the 130th year of the life of Adam upon the earth that he again knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare a son in his likeness and in his image. And she called his name Seth, saying, Because God has appointed me another seed in the place of Abel, for Cain has slain him. Now this is the really interesting passage because, um, again, it, Seth and Abel, um, Abel, they are conceived in the image of Adam because they are the children of Adam. But Cain is not regarded as being born in the likeness and the image of Adam because he was not Adam's son. 
the book of Jubilees, chapter 4, verse 7. And Adam his wife and his wife mourned for Abel four weeks of years. And in the fourth year of the fifth week, they became joyful. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare him a son. And he called his name Seth. For he said, God hath raised up a second seed unto us on the earth instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. Did you, did you catch that? Seth, you know, the, which his name means substitute, replacement. It was because Abel was murdered that, you know, when Adam knew his wife again, and she bare him a son, they called his name Seth, meaning substitute or replacement. And it, it says here, and God raised up a second seed, which counting children, Abel, yes, was the firstborn of Adam and Eve, and Seth was the secondborn of Adam and Eve. And the only way that adds up is if Cain is not regarded as Adam's son. Because if Cain was the firstborn of Adam and Eve, and Abel was the secondborn of Adam and Eve, then Seth would be the thirdborn, the third child of Adam and Eve. But that's not what the text says. The text says, God hath raised up a second seed, unto us on the earth instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. The book of Jubilees, chapter 4, verse 7. All right, just a couple more things, and then I'll make final commentary. Um, in the book of Enoch, chapter 9, it says this. And I saw the spirits of the sons of men who were dead, and their voices reached to heaven while they were accusing. Then I inquired of Raphael, an angel who was with me, and said, Whose spirit is that, the voice of which reaches to heaven and accuses? He answered, saying, This is the spirit of Abel who was slain by Cain, his brother, and who will accuse that brother until his seed be destroyed from the face of the earth, until his seed perish from the seed of the human race. And so you have distinction as far as the children of Cain, the seed of the serpent, from that of regular humanity, which is the seed of the woman. And here you see, Abel accusing his brother because he was murdered. And again, this is why in chapter 5, you have Adam's genealogy listed, and in chapter 4, you have Cain genealogy listed. Uh, again, 1 John chapter 3, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, the wicked one meaning the enemy which snuck into the garden and that sowed the tares, the same wicked one that is cited as the devil. I mean, how how can you deny all of this information? It's just, uh, there's just so much. It's overwhelming. But yet, most people do. All right. Um, wicked one and slew his brother and wherefore slew he him because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous why is he evil Adam's not evil who is evil Satan is evil he's the first murderer the liar and the deceiver and Cain is also known as such and why because the serpent is his father all right. Now, so many people say that, you know, again, this is not found 
in the scriptures, in the Holy Bible, in the canon. But you can go to Isaiah chapter 14. And in verse 18, it says, all the kings of the nation, even all of them, lie in glory, everyone in his own house. But thou, speaking to Lucifer, son of the morning, but thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. And as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers, who are the seed of the evildoers? The tares. And when you look up an abominable branch, that's like a stem of the family tree. If the family tree is humanity, Lucifer, because he has his own children, the seed of the serpent, he is an abominable branch. He's a part of that family tree, which is why it says in this passage, uh, God says, the seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers that they do not rise nor possess the land nor fill the face of the world with cities. And so God is talking about waging war against the tares who are the seed of the evildoers, the children of perdition, the children of the wicked one, the tares, the goats, uh, and the sons of Belial. I mean, oh my gosh, it is just... There's so much to it. One more one more verse. This is from the Kebron Nagas, chapter 3. And he drove him out of the garden because his apostasy through the sin of the serpent and the plotting of the devil. And at that sorrowful moment, Cain was born. And when Adam saw that the face of Cain was ill-tempered or sullen and his appearance evil, he was sad. And then Abel was born, and when Adam saw that his appearance was good and his face good-tempered, he said, this is my son, the heir of my kingdom. And again, that just tells you, emphasizes the distinction between Cain as the serpent seed and Abel as the seed of the woman, which again, because Abel was murdered, by his half-brother Cain, he was replaced by Seth, which Seth means substitute. And so, oh, there's so much more I could go into. Uh, the fact that this particular bloodline is tied to the Pharisees, which is why Christ said, ye are of your father the devil, and then he blamed them for the blood from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, I shall be required of this generation. Woe unto you, lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. And so, I mean, there's so much. They hide the truth. They hide the truth of who they are. They were responsible for the murders of the prophets from Abel to Zacharias. They were even responsible for the murder of Christ in conspiring to kill him. That's why he said, um, you know, I know you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. They are uh, Abraham's seed, Ishmael, which he is also counted as the seed of perdition, just like Esau, even though he was born, you know, a twin with Jacob. Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Jacob was favored. And it's because, again, the difference, the distinction between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. 
Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them that killed the prophets. All right. Well, God bless all. Good night. I hope this tied it all together for you. Be blessed in your seeking.